Assalamualaikum, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Institute of Marine Engineering, Science and Technology Technical Meeting. My name is uh, Nikki Vignani, and I'm the honorary secretary of the Institute's uh, UAE branch. Joining me from the from the IRS UAE branch is uh, Mr. Shane Cabral. He is the uh, honorary treasurer. And we have uh, Fahad Haik, who is uh, in charge of the IMRS TV. The IMRS TV, for those of you who are not aware, is, uh, is our worldwide uh, uh, platform where we capture presentations such as uh, this. Uh, Fahad does the recording, he does the processing. He sends it off to our head office in London. They edit it and make it available for 23,000 members all over the world. If you have a question to ask or you have a comment to make, uh, most welcome. It's an open forum here, so everybody is encouraged to, to raise their uh, opinions and pass their comments and ask their questions. So please raise your hand, uh, identify yourself. Well, raise your hand, wait for the mic to reach you, as, uh, as this nice gentleman has done, and identify yourself and ask the question to the relevant uh, panelists. We're gonna, have a, we're gonna have a panel discussion. Well, the two, two, two gentlemen who will be here, so uh, talking about uh, topics which I'll tell you about in the next few minutes. So please direct your question to the appropriate person, please. We, uh, speaking of raising your hand, may I ask all the marine engineers in the room to raise your hands, please? Right, there are about 100 and just 137 people, and I see a, a fair amount of marine engineers in the room. Yeah, gentlemen, please, you can put your, put your hands down. <laughs> that is steam and motor. My major. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and all of you who raised your hands, all right, from all of you who raised your hands, is there anybody in the room who never had a problem with a marine engine? Expected. I, you? You know, you're a marine engineer, yeah. and you never had a problem with the marine engine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you you have to sponsor the next meeting, my friend, and then do your sales pitch. Huh? <laughs> okay. Uh, so the honest truth is, no, <laughs> nobody raised their hand to that very obvious question. I mean, we saw the video earlier. Right. That was a that was a video on the on a typical uh, container ship. Uh, you, you, you witness the same flexing and bending of ships, even if it's a, a bulk carrier. Most of it's a bulk carrier. Uh, these are and of course uh, ships machinery uh, operates in uh, not only in that uh, kind of uh, uh, environment, but it also is exposed to extreme temperatures and high humidity in enclosed spaces, where there's there's forced uh, ventilation. So. So machinery and uh, systems are bound to break down, right? It'll, it's a utopic situation if nothing happens. And you saw that in that video. Yet, modern marine engines are expected to be reliable. They're expected to be compact, so occupy a small footprint, for example. They're expected to be environmentally friendly, very important cost effective, and so on and so forth. Very demanding KPIs on an engine which is installed on a ship. Uh, a ship owner, some of them are here in the room, they want to have their cake and eat it too. And what we're gonna hear today is an engine which comes mighty close to that. So let's wait and see what Watsila tells us about such an engine. Now also, uh, ships, especially the, uh, the underwater portion of the ship, the immersed hull and its appendages, uh, from time to time may require an inspection or a repair. And when that happens, uh, the obvious choice is to run into dry docks. I see some of my friends from Dubai dry docks here. So they are happy if you get the ship in there and they earn their, they earn their uh, revenue. But what if you carry out that same inspection or repair underwater with the assistance of specialist diver technicians, right? And that 
can be, this work can be performed concurrently with port calls instead of that expensive dry docking, which therefore leads to minimized vessel downtime and it maintains obviously a shipping company's profits and reputation, especially if you're a, you're a ship manager. This is another relatively new service of Vatsila that we will hear about this evening. Thank you very much, uh, Vatsila. Thank you very much, uh, Rajan and the rest of the team and Vivek and uh, everybody else involved. So uh, let's uh, show them a uh, appreciation with a round of applause. Thank you, Vatsila. Okay. So our first speaker for the day, and this is the hardest part for me. <laughs> Adri Hughesbrecht. Close enough, we are Mr. Hughesbrecht. He's the uh, senior consultant, uh, and in fact, uh, Adri is the founder of Trident VD, now Watsila Underwater Services. Adri is an active commercial diver with a career spanning over 25 years including managing director up until February 2018 when Trident was uh, acquired by Watsila. At present, Adri is working for UWS as uh, an advisor and consultant and a member of the UWS management team. Adri, welcome to Dubai and welcome onto the stage. Adri. Very much. Good evening, everybody. As uh, mentioned, my name is uh, Adri Heibrecht, and I'm the representative for Trident BP, Watsila Underwater Services, and I want to run you through some slides that we have on this topic. Um, Trident BP was established in, uh, in 93. And we started as a diving company, and before that I was a commercial diver for 11 years, and I continued that career within starting uh, the old, my own company in, uh, in 93 in Trident. Our aim was to, uh, to do the more technical, challenging uh, jobs underwater and come up with solutions for, uh, for our clients, meaning uh, jobs that have never been done before underwater. We would look closer into it, get more detail, try and work together with the various uh, original equipment manufacturers to get more knowledge of the product and thus be able to do a better job below the waterline. Um, we, are, we, are, we have been and we still are the choice of many uh, equipment manufacturers for this and we're trying to get our divers in their training programs. The key benefits of underwater services is um, the vessels are going to the dry dock uh, on, a, on a regular basis, but in between always things happen. There's underwater cleanings that are found necessary, there's some type of repair works, and we, we're trying to expand our, uh, our scope of, uh, of capability over the past uh, 25 years. So the aim is that we try and, and manage and repair or maintain the vessels in between those set dry docking periods. Um, by doing that, we're trying to, to uh, optimize the downtime of vessels when they are loading, unloading inside the, the port. So any job that we need to do during, um, during these port calls, we try and divide them over maybe separate uh, port calls. Because if you're changing a bow thruster, for example, below the waterline, that is a job that is not done in eight hours, so it might take 40 hours or so. But we can divide the scope of work over several ports. So keeping this in mind, it might give you an opportunity to improve your planning for dry docking. If you know, for example, that there is something wrong with a stabilizer pin or a bow thruster ahead of time, and you can only find out when the ship is in dry dock what the issue is, then you might be too late. There might not be spare parts or they might not be able to finish it in time. So then the other water uh, capabilities of, of our company might come to use for that. So we might remove the, use, the unit when we know it's broken anyway, prior to the dry docking, to send it to the, to the, to the workshop or to the, to the, and have it fixed by the time the vessel is coming to dry dock, then you can reinstall it, or even reinstall it underwater also. That's, that's 
Um, obviously, the company is approved by all major classifications and societies that speaks for itself. And we have a 24 7 mobile service. Not meaning that we're in every location in the world, but we're working to all of this. And obviously, uh, we respect the environment that we, that we work in. Uh, this is, this is uh, today's uh, global presence. So if we're looking at the, uh, the yellow dots, those are actually locations where we have feet on the ground and we have a workshop that we have the qualified uh, divers and equipment uh, on site. And then the white dots is that it's the network of diving companies that we've been working with over the past 25 years. So we know about their uh, capabilities, but also about their limitations, obviously. And if we are working around the globe, and that is what we are doing, we are traveling and we're trying to keep things as, as efficient as possible. So we are including the local diving companies to support our services. So that means sometimes they can put some uh, manpower on the job that we, uh, that we need to support it, or equipment. And that is depending on, 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 what they, on what they have and what their standard is for diving. So if there are smaller jobs like in-water surveys, we would pass them on to the local diving company to be cost effective, so it's not the aim that we're traveling everywhere, but we could be the contact for, for clients to, to support them. We recently opened our, uh, our uh, division here uh, in Dubai, that is the latest, and we have been in uh, Las Palmas, we are in Valencia since uh, last year. We have an office in Livorno, and the head office of Trident is in Tunisia in the Netherlands. Um, one of the things that makes us a little bit different from the average companies, or from the average diving company, is that we are pushing our, ourselves a bit forward with the original equipment manufacturers to, to, to see if there's options that we can get into their training program. Because the technical people, service engineers, etc., they get an in-house training from the manufacturer, so they know more about the product, so that they're in a better position to do the job. Same counts for, for divers. So we're, we're working toward being service engineers for underwater. And that we don't need to be able to start a main engine. That's not the level that we would be looking for. But it would be very helpful if we have all the, 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 the equipment that is below the waterline, that we have good knowledge about the mechanical parts. So talking about bow thrusters, gearboxes, rudders, etc. So that's what we get trained well with Wachtella, but also with other uh, original equipment manufacturers. This is an example of uh, the Land and Sea Academy in the Netherlands, where we have uh, people going there, so they, they get to learn about the hydrodynamics of propellers, because we normally see propellers when they're broken, that's when the divers are called in, and we need to be able to evaluate the, the damage that we see. This is a typical uh, setup of our equipment. This is a, a built-for-purpose container that we are using, because we are doing a lot of uh, Hyperbaric works, meaning uh, in dry conditions below the waterline, because there is no ship owner and there is no original equipment and manufacturer that likes to see any seawater between their gears and bearings. So therefore, we work in a lot of cases in a dry environment. This is a typical setup of the uh, diving equipment that we use locally in Europe. We have set a standard and we are maintaining that standard on every location that we are that we are building and where the company is uh, expanding. So it's built to the IMCA standard and it's ready to go anywhere we, uh, anywhere we travel. Um, our service offering. There's a lot of uh, propulsion related uh, repair work below the water like that we do. Obviously now being part of the Wachtela organization, we, we are well trained in that respect, but also with the other OEMs. So it's uh, steerable thrusters, transverse thrusters, even stabilizer fins that we, are, that we are doing. We'll see that later in the presentation. We are working on uh, rudders and uh, machinery repairs below the water. Here's a typical example of the concept of a hyperbaric uh, coffer then. So basically what we are trying to create or what we are creating below the waterline is a dry environment. It's, it's a pressurized environment that it's like if you put a, a bucket upside down on the water, there will always be a, an air bubble uh, remaining inside. And that's basically the concept of what we are doing here, but just on a little bit of a larger scale. So this is a, the, the concept. So you're installing this yellow box underneath the, the vessel or the rig, 
and we'll let air escape inside this enclosed area and the, the air will push the water down to the level where we need it. Now the divers, the diver technicians, they can enter from the open bottom, they climb in and they are in a dry environment but it's pressurized so you need to be the commercial diver to be able to be in there. And that in combination with the training that we have with the OEMs makes it, makes it a, a, a different uh, uh, approach to problems that there are on the water. That was this, the picture, this is the, this is the real life, this is a job we've done in uh, Norway a while ago. So this could be transported by, uh, by truck and we built it up on the location and the aim there was to change uh, shaft seals on, uh, on various thrusters that were underneath uh, the rig. Here is an atmospheric copper dive. So it's, it's, a, it's a commonly um, known uh, way of working below the waterline, which is also a very safe way of working, but it's also rather bulky. So if we get a call of something that's broken, they need us to be there in, the, in, in one hour or in one day. And if you want to work using this concept, then that's not, that's not really feasible. It needs to build like, like a bypass for the, for the vessel. So it's, it's not in line with what we're thinking. We want to travel light to, to, be, uh, to be in attendance as quickly as possible. But it's a very safe manner. So if you want to execute works always on one location, then it's a very good, then it's a, it's a very good uh, option. Here is an example of an, uh, a hyperbaric repair that we did on sliding bearings on a, on a, uh, on a uh, transverse thruster. Um, it got stuck, they loaded it in a certain position and then the bearings of the uh, steering column, they got stuck. And we were called in and together, and that time it was with, with uh, Rolls Royce that we worked on this uh, unit, uh, we developed a procedure to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to look at the, the problem. Everybody was in agreement and then we went there and that was a team of 28 divers and we were there for six days to fix the problem successfully. So in this case, the divers are working in a dry environment, but it's pressurized. So they're having their helmet on to get to the location, and once they're there, you can take it off. The air is, uh, is constantly uh, ventilated, there's communication, there's lights and there's uh, video to monitor from the surface. But the work is done by the, by the divers that are trained as technicians. This is the remainings of the bearings that we pulled out in that, uh, in that location. So everything was done uh, below the waterline. Here's another example of a uh, unit that failed on a, uh, on a specialty vessel that was uh, moored alongside a uh, shipyard in, um, in South Africa. There was no driver availability at that time in the shipyard and they did want to solve this problem. So we went to, uh, to Norway to talk to the OEM about the, the, the technicalities about removing this unit because it's not designed for, for exchanging underwater and you need to know what you're up against before you, you even consider of doing a, a job like this. So we spent two days of uh, training in uh, Norway talking to the service engineers from the, from the uh, OEM and then we felt confident that we could uh, do the job. Then we went, to, uh, we went to South Africa and we removed uh, the unit uh, below the waterline without any water ingress in the, in the system. So after the, the people from the OEM, they renewed the uh, horizontal shaft, uh, they renewed the bearings and the, the seals, and we reinstalled it uh, below the waterline. So if it's, if it's cost effective, in that case for the client it was very cost effective because there was no other option, there was no driver availability, so they had to go for this option. Um, solutions at a glance. Uh, underwater services, it, we work both in the shipping industry but also a little bit in the offshore and that's becoming uh, more and more. Uh, Watsonland and there's other makers that have this uh, underwater demountable units so that's one of the, the, the services that we, uh, that we provide. Here's some nice pictures of heavy units that, uh, that are lowered on the strand jacks and then normally the load is transferred to the, uh, to the floating crane or the, the rig crane by itself and then it's lifted to the surface. It looks like it's a, it's a big job but basically from a dive technical point of view it's not that, not, not that complicated because it's connecting the right shackle to the right pad iron is basically what it is. It's more monitoring the load and, and uh, inspecting and looking at what's going on. 
Here is, uh, here, here is an example of a job that we've done uh, last year. This was done in Las Palmas. The rig was there to, to go for cold stacking, for layup, and they want to do that in shallow water. So they removed the units uh, prior to the footage on the anchors, and we removed uh, the six units from this, uh, from this rig. Here is an example of, of an innovative solution for those, for those type of uh, azimuthing uh, thrusters. We got a request from a from a large Dutch uh, contractor to look at one of their uh, to look at one of their vessels <coughs> and then to remove the uh, the, the azimuthing thrusters in uh, in shallow water. So even if there is little water underneath the field, they were looking at options because they didn't have handling pipes on their vessel, so they have issues. So if they would go to dry dock, they would either have to double lock the vessel or, the, or they have to have a pit, but there's no dry dock with six pits in the right in the right spot. So they had issues with that and they asked us to look at uh, a possible solution for this problem. So we came up with this uh, with this uh, concept by doing it. And basically what you are what you are doing is um, we are lowering the, uh, the 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 unit by the steering column to the right uh, level and you can see in this area here, this is the front where it's uh, when it's in retracted shape. That's where the unit normally is. But we blow down the water to about this level here that you that you can see. Now you're in a dry condition, so you can disconnect the flanges. Um, this unit here, it's a floating device that we bring underneath the uh, that we bring underneath the, the rig, and the load is transferred from the from the uh, steering column to the floating pontoon. So it has hydraulic jacks in there, and you can you can use it. Now, once the, the unit is hanging on the uh, on the floating pontoon, now you can you can ballast it so it's neutrally buoyant below the waterline, and then we move it using uh, either uh, the winches from the deck. We connect it to the shore crane, and we pull it out, and you can you can lift it to the surface, or you can pull it in range of the crane that is available. So that is done for offshore uh, units as well. Here is another example of a of uh, an innovative solution that we uh, that we have designed together with uh, with Waxilla. When when the uh, when the with the oil market and the oil and gas industry. It's coming down, there's a lot of rigs that are laid up for a period of time, and we figured out a way, how can we preserve the, the, uh, the propulsion equipment that is below the waterline. So this, this uh, concept that we, uh, that we thought of is contains a, a, a flexible material. So we are installing the flexible material around the, the unit, and it's sealing up against uh, the hull. Now the salt water that is inside the bag is pumped out and it's replaced by fresh water. Then we add an additive to that that prevents any marine growth to uh, develop in that period. And you can shrink the, the, uh, the system, the more water you pump out, you can shrink the system around the, uh, the azimuthing thruster and now it is stable to sit there for a year or one and a half year or forever is required. The, the advantage of this concept is that in case there is a contract coming up and everyone wants to, to go back to work and you need to go to that contract, the, the seals are intact and the units are intact and there will not be any marine growth. So you're, you're reducing the risk dramatically of having delays of reactivating uh, the rig because of the units. Here's an example of uh, Traveling light, as I mentioned earlier, this is uh, sheets that we have designed for uh, allowing us to work on tunnel thrusters in a, in a dry condition. To give you an idea, on, on, on a monthly scale, we, we change underwater about 45 uh, units uh, on a global on a global uh, basis. So we, we, we are able to travel light because these sheets you can fold up and it allows us to, to dry the, the, the thrust of the tunnel. And again, it's a hyperbaric condition that you're working in, but it allows us to do our job. On the right-hand pictures that you see here, this is an example of one of those sheets which is uh, installed on the unit. And it's blow and dry, so the air is up to this level. 
and the diver has an entrance in the bottom. So it's just large enough to get in there with, uh, with equipment and all. And then you are working in a dry condition to but pressurize, as mentioned earlier. Um, these sheets, they are attached by, uh, by screw dogs, how we call them. That's, that's uh, our own design. And we've done our engineering on that to make sure that they're strong enough to hold the forces that are working on, on the, the flexible materials. But also because we weld them under water, but also to find out how much weld that we need to put on to also make it easy to remove them after we're done with the work. Because we're not leaving anything behind. And you're welding like 50 or 60 of these clamps, depending on the size of the tunnel, on the surrounding of the, of the tunnel, and they all have to be removed. So it's also a time, timing thing that we can remove them uh, easy. This is again where the training comes in. So once we have installed those uh, flexible materials on the port and the starboard side of the tunnel, and if it's in dry condition, now the real work begins, like what you normally would do in the driver. So we open up the end cover and we'll, we'll, we'll carry out the scope as found necessary. So that could be uh, working on the OD box, on the OD pipe, or, or pitch indicator system, or whatever is required. We will know what to do. This is a, an example of a, of a vessel that just came out of dry dock. There was, a, there was a cruise ship some time ago, and uh, there was some, some cloths left behind during the overhaul of the unit. And we found out by, by using endoscopes to go into that system. So again, we installed our flexible uh, materials there. And we ended up having to change the, uh, the OD box and the oil distribution pipe on this unit. But this oil distribution pipe is like two and a half meters length. So between the unit and our flexible material, there is not enough space to make the angle to slide this pipe into. So we created a log in our flexible material, allowing us to put the two and a half meters pipe in there and then move it on the right level into the, uh, into the unit and then finish. This is, uh, we call it a dome system. This is what we use on a typical thruster exchange for underwater. So it's an internal seal that, or an internal blank that we designed to, 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 to the ship's design for each individual tunnel thruster if we need to remove the complete unit. So it's hold by this foundation and it's bolted back on the foundation of the electromotor. So the electromotor is used, we'll put our blank underneath, we secure it with the, uh, with the uh, system here, and now you can see this, this uh, this uh, round uh, shaft here, it's uh, sealed with uh, O-rings and it allows us to lower the, uh, the gearbox into the tunnel without having any water into the, the, the bow thruster tunnel or the bow thruster room. Here is another uh, example of a, of a technical solution that we provided to a cruise customer of ours from, from Hamburg they had an issue with the stabilizer fin. And uh, they weren't, they weren't uh, able to complete the repair work that needed to be done within the dry dock period. So the ship had to leave without the stabilizer fin installed. So they came to, uh, to us and see if we would think it would be feasible to install it uh, during a cruise <coughs> underwater. So well, we, need to, we need to work again with, uh, with, the, uh, with the original equipment manufacturer, which was SKF from Hamburg at that uh, at that moment, and they, they told us, well, forget about it, that's impossible to, to install a unit like that underwater because you need to have, well, the good clearances and stuff. There was a lot of, a lot of question, question marks, but the technical manager of the, of the owners, they, they said, why don't we have discussion around it and see if we can find answers to all the questions that we have. So that was done in, uh, in Hamburg with a team of uh, like 10 people to go over this, this uh, specific topic. And then the, o the OEM, they, they asked a bunch of questions. Well, you can't do this and you can't do that. But we were able to answer all these questions. And then the conclusion of the technical manager was say, well, if they're doing what they say they're doing, then it should be feasible to do it on the water. So they went ahead with it. And everybody in the room knew that it was never done before. So this was the first time ever. And then um, we, we, we got the order to, uh, to do that. And then we worked out the details. We did our engineering. We changed the procedures with SDF. And then it started to be, become a good working relationship because it's a technical challenge, but
but also the technical people from SPF, they are really interested. They're not so much interested in the risk they're taking by, by supporting this, but they are interested in the technical solution. And we ended up doing that successfully in uh, 56 hours, we included it. And to give you an idea, the weight of this unit is 25 tons, and we have installed it, including the, the crux, that's how they, they call it. And there is, it needs to be installed into a vessel in a 14 degree angle, and it needs to slide up in the, in the, uh, in the chamber where normally the, uh, the fin is, uh, is housed. And there is a clearance on top of the machine uh, faces and on the bottom of about 14 millimeters. So it's really tight fix, and that was also the, the, the problem that they, that they saw. But we overcome that problem, and, and we, we've done this work uh, successfully. Um, here is that your uh, picture that we are rightfully working together with the, with the uh, service engineers from SKF in this uh, manner. So on the left-hand picture, they are installing the, uh, the, the, the top and the bottom uh, bearing. So there was no water egress. The vessel was afloat, was full of passengers, and we've done the work during its voyage within the time that, that we gave it. On the right-hand picture, um, every morning before every shift starts, we get together, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the plan that we are doing, the supervisor is doing that, and then we start executing uh, our work. This is a big thank you letter from the, uh, from the client after we've done the job successfully. But what, what I find interesting is we've done something that wasn't done before, and they, they told us that, that changes our mind of how we approach these kind of problems. Because they're saying on cruise ships, if you have a stabilizer fin, it might be sitting in storage or in the, in the workout for like 30% of the lifetime of a vessel. Because they're going to dry dock in, 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 uh, in every five years. Now, if they can't fix the problem during that dry dock period, it's already 10 years that it's in, in. If you're a little bit unlucky, then it could be 10 years that it's sitting in the storage. So they're really thinking about this option. We could, we could consider doing it, maybe removing it if it's damaged prior to going to dry dock, have it fixed, and then install it. So it's, it's a peace of mind, but it has to be cost effective, obviously. Here's an example of a job that we've done in the beginning of this year that was in uh, Norway. A loaded bulk carrier went, uh, went aground, and uh, the rudder stock was, uh, was bent. So we, we went to talk to the owners and the, uh, we came up with a, with a solution to remove the, lot, the, the complete rudder below the waterline, remove the rudder stock in a float uh, condition, then change the Thornton bearings on the upper and lower pinto, and then put everything back. And this was accepted by the class as a permanent repair. So we removed it in, uh, we worked like for I think a week or so to get the, the rudder to the surface. So on the left-hand picture, you see the divers making the, the preparation work. On the middle, the rigging is installed and the, the, the rudder is lowered. And on the right-hand picture, you can clear, a little bit see that the rudder is removed from the vessel. Then it took five weeks to get the rudder stock back when it was straightened in, in uh, Norway. Then we installed everything uh, back in place and that was, that was the job done. So that is the kind of services that we can provide with our, with our company. Um, propeller repairs, that's a, big, that's a big chunk of our, of, our, uh, of our work. We've been executing those jobs as long as the company is there, so, so that's now about 25 plus years. We've developed uh, tools for blade straightening and uh, also cutting and, uh, cutting and grinding, obviously, if they are damaged. And again, the training comes in that we know what we're doing. If we evaluate a damaged propeller, we, we can tell what to do. This is an example. If you see the middle picture, that is, uh, that is a, a 90 degree bent aft on a, uh, on a reef vessel. This job was actually done offshore in uh, Miami. I, I was on this job myself, so I know. And then after we straightened the blades, it would look like on the right hand picture. That's the same vessel a couple of hours later because as you see, it's getting a little bit uh, dark. So it's, it's back to its near original uh, geometry. So the vessel can continue its voyage without uh, losing any efficiency on the, uh, on the propeller. Doesn't mean that it's a permanent repair because you need to do an MVP inspection on it after you've, you've worked on a, on a propeller. That, that is doable, but most clients, they choose not to do so. They just want to get out of that situation and move on. 
But using the Eddy-Turin method, you can, do, you can do an NDT inspection on a propeller blades. On the left-hand side, you can see uh, our in-house developed tooling for, uh, for uh, throwing at those problems. Here's, uh, here's an interesting tool that we've uh, designed uh, in-house. This is a, a video that we are testing in the, our training facility in the Netherlands. Underwater, moving material, it's hard to do. There is the, the normal way of doing that is, is grinding. And now we were looking at doing propeller modifications on, on large uh, propellers, like 10 meter diameter propellers, with large modifications on the, on the trailing edges. But therefore, a lot of material needs to be removed. So we work together with uh, Trident, uh, Marin, the Research and Development Center Center in the Netherlands. Watson was involved in this, and we developed a method of removing uh, material fast from from uh, from the normal situation. Here is what you see of the product, the finished product that we provide for underwater. So this is a, 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 an anti-singing edge on a 10 meter diameter propeller. Well, we have changed the design of the, uh, the anti-singing edge. So very important to know on, on these modifications is, is the sharpness of these edges here. So it's a very, really shallow edge, but it needs to be sharp to get, the, to get the right profile. We get the templates to measure it on every uh, radii on the uh, propeller from the, from the OEM. But we are doing the same shop quality job underwater as they would do in the dry land. Obviously, cutting and grinding is, is a portion of those jobs because if, if the propeller hit a chain or, or whatever and if there is some mechanical damage on it by missing pieces and stuff, we will calculate the, uh, the static balance on the drawings meeting the ISO 484 standard and we will crop the pieces that are necessary to crop and then we calculate what we need to do on the opposing blades if, if required. <coughs> if it is within the, the, the tolerance, then we're not touching it, but if it exceeds the tolerance, then we'll make, we'll make uh, modifications. Um, if we go on board a vessel, we're always trying to work on the official uh, original drawings that came with the, with the propeller design, because that's the only way you can report in a proper manner. So here's an example of that. Um, another emergency repair that we've carried out, exchanging a, a CPP blade on a vessel in, uh, that was on the Azori Islands. Then you see on the left-hand picture that they lost half the blade, so the ship was paralyzed, but they had spare blades on, on board. So we mobilized our equipment and team to go there during the weekend, and they've, uh, they've exchanged uh, the blade underwater. So, you, we're using the same tools, so we're meeting the, the torque values, etc., that are set by the OEM. So it's basically a similar job that could be done uh, in the dry dock, but we're doing it underwater. I see those questions coming from the dry dock. <laughs> <laughs> um, installing of energy saving devices. If a client decides to go for an energy saving device by Watsala, or by any, by any maker, why wait until you're going to the next ride? I mean, you might as well install it right away. After you've done the purchase, you place the PO and it's delivered, then you, you could install it underwater. We have procedures in place together with Watsala that we have developed, so we can install them with the same quality as they do in the drive up below the waterline. Propeller polishing. I'm sure most of the people here in the room, you might have heard about this, this maintenance uh, job. Normally, it's done, uh, in a lot of cases, it's done on the water because there's some fuel efficiency to gain there. And it's measured by a, a comparator, and it's a Rupert scale uh, ship's propeller roughness gauge. So basically, on the picture here, you can see you're making a comparison to the, to, the, to the surface of the blade and whatever comes closest. And if this is, like here, it says it's an A, so this, this, this is about an, an A quality, and that is, uh, that is the same as a one micro uh, hole roughness. So we have been looking at that and we've been doing that for years also, but we think you can do a better job on that. So if the Rupert A is the best result that you can get on the, uh, on the blade, then we developed that a little bit further. And we took a blade from the Land and Sea Academy from, from Wetzela 
and we, we, we used the grinding stone to make it rough, which you can see there on the left-hand picture. Then we installed it in our training tank. We sent the divers in, and they polished it to our standard. And then that's how it came out in the middle. And this is the finish that we, uh, that, that we accomplished. Then we measured the, the roughness of the blade, and it says 0.12, and that was about the average. It was anywhere between one-tenth of a micro and, and two-tenths of, of, of a micro uh, clear. So there is like eight times more smooth than, the, uh, than what, is, what is normally done. It doesn't mean that, that that transfers automatically to eight times more efficiency, but it does gain more efficiency. And we are now in the process of measuring that, proving our, proving our point. But that is what we do as a, a company. This is what, uh, what it should look like. So it's a, it's a true mirror image. When you're reaching that, uh, that hole, that roughness on the propeller faces, then that's what it should be looking at. Shaft sealing systems. Um, if it's done in the dry dock, bonding seals, we are bonding seals below the waterline. In 2005, we won an award in, in the Netherlands for this, uh, for this design, because we financed it ourselves, we, we, we developed the concept, and we put it to market, so we actually have clients that are buying this service. And now it's like an industry standard, because cruise ships, they don't even consider going to dry dock for this kind of service, because they know it's, it's, a, it's a guaranteed, uh, feasible, technical solution to that, to that problem. This is the concept on the left-hand picture. You see the, the, uh, the hyperbaric habitat, flexible habitat installed. And on the right-hand picture, you can see the design. So there is a guy standing in a dry condition on the starboard side of the propeller and also on the port side. And then there's somebody that's bringing equipment up and down. So the water level is about here. So they're working in a dry environment. And again, this could be folded up and sent in a box and on any commercial airplane together with the diver it'll go to the location where we need to be. Here's a view inside the uh, unit. So on the left-hand picture, we have opened up the, uh, the shaft seal uh, assembly. We can inspect the liner and do what's, what, is, what is necessary. And then we bond the, uh, the new seals in, in situ, meeting the OES requirements. And we've done testing on that because it's a warranty uh, repair. Ship husbandry, like normal maintenance, that's part of the uh, of the scope of work that we do. We are the, the builders and manufacturers of our own underwater cleaning equipment. This is a conventional system where everything that you are removing from the ship's hull is is falling to the seabed. And now with the environmental restrictions, etc., that are playing now, we took it a bit further and we are developing a system that's environmental friendly, clean, that's environmental friendly. So the the the, the idea is to have a similar machine that works well below the waterline, but we, are, we will capture everything that we move from the, from the hull, we'll pump it to the surface, we'll run it through a filter system, and then the, the, uh, the water, the exhaust water, would flow back into the, in the seabed without any, causing any damage to the environment. Here is the uh, latest prototype on the right-hand picture. So it has a three-inch hose that transports the water that we are processing to the surface, and then it's filtered. On the left-hand picture, that is, a, that is a, a concept, or it's actually a prototype that we've built for a really heavy marine growth that you'd find on storage tankers, etc. So it'll remove uh, marine growth in a res relatively fast uh, way, up to 15 centimeters as thickness. Underwater welding. Um, there's a lot of companies that claim that they do underwater welding. We took it a little bit of a step further and we've developed uh, uh, procedures ourselves for underwater welding and we are meeting the same quality as they would do in the dry dock. Like Class A welds, we are a certified company and certi we have certified welders to produce that type of welding but then below the waterline. Here is an example of a cruise ship that went aground in the south of uh, France. They called us in for a temporary repair to be able to in, in, inspect the, 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 the affected area inside the vessel. So now if you go to class, and we had fitted this, this uh, double plate in a matter of uh, two days, 
and we welded it uh, all around, allowing the vessel to pump out the tank and do internal inspections and deal with, with the internal structure as found necessary. So that's, that, is, that is an example of welding. As we are doing these, these, these uh, propulsion-related repairs, it's always heavy equipment. It could be a, like a stabilizer fin, it could be a rudder, it could be a bow thrust or lower gearbox, but there is always welding involved in our work. So we are really, we are really pushing on that, uh, pushing the quality of the welding. Here's examples of, of welding that we have done. So in, in this case here, it's a really thick material and it, it represents the thickness of the, uh, the shaft tunnel. And here it's the steel that is attached to that. So we've, we've made a crack or a, it's, it's a junction here. And the diver, he prepared the weld underwater in the right angle, put the double plate underneath, and then he fully welded it with a full pen weld, but everything done underwater. This is the result, so we're, we're, we're saying it, but it's, it's backed up by the, uh, by the classification society. So these procedures are indeed uh, certified by various classification societies. Actually, they were part, like B and EGL, they were, they were truly supporting us. They sent surveyors to our shop to, to support us with, with, with the welding engineering part during that uh, week, so they were really uh, supportive. Here's an example of where we're actually executing. This is, again, it's a cruise vessel that, uh, that uh, had troubles on the rudder horn and on the rudder, uh, suffering from, from uh, cavitation erosion. And we got permission from, uh, from Lord Register in that case to weld it, to clad weld it up. And the vessel was allowed to uh, sail further till the next uh, scheduled dry dock. So we spent uh, a month welding in every port that this cruise vessel uh, came. The, the passengers would go uh, offshore, or they would go uh, and, and, and go shopping, and we would be welding in the water until the ship sailed to the next port. So we joined the ship uh, for, uh, for a month. Here's a, uh, a repair, an underwater repair, uh, like it's a permanent shell plate repair, where we are uh, cutting out an, uh, an insert and installing an insert, putting back the frames. This is probably something that you, you people are, are aware of. But that's also one of the items that we do uh, on a regular basis. Inspections and surveys. Like we're doing a lot of repair work. I think 70 or 80 percent of, of the, the times we are working that would be on, on repair jobs. But also like in water survey, underwater cleaning, propeller polishings, that is part of the scope which we also, which we also uh, execute. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, um, that was uh, very interesting, uh, Adrian. Our next presentation is going to be from uh, Greg Young. Uh, Greg Young joined uh, Axila in September 2018 with specific responsibility for the introduction of the new Axila 14 high speed engine and gen set. He has over 35 years' experience within high speed product markets from sales and business development to engineering and customer support and service. Prior to joining Watsila, he was responsible for global marine sales and business development for a leading engine manufacturer. Greg, welcome to Dubai and onto the stage. Thank you for the chance to talk about the, the new Watsila 14. It's nice to see some old faces and nice to see some new faces, so thank you. Uh, We've got some questions, which we'll cover at the end. Uh, one caveat. I can talk about World Cup cricket, I can talk about World Cup rugby, but we're not talking about Brexit, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm gonna introduce our Vartzler 14. Here's a nice picture of it. It's a pretty compact, nice, powerful, and versatile product. What I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about why. Why we have a Vartala 14. We have a partner. We didn't do, just do this on ourselves. Um, where the engine can go, or where the Gentech can go. Um, some product details, which uh, hopefully people are, are interested in. A little bit about the timing. Uh, a couple of comparisons between uh, market, uh, well-known market products in, the, in high speed. 
talk a little bit about service and support, and then obviously at the end we'll, uh, we'll take questions. So why? Why VAP the 14? I picked out three reasons here. The first one being to go down to the bottom. And you look at that, and you look at all those orange rectangles, and the one that was missing was high speed. If you look at what Bartola can offer, we've got medium speed, we've got ship design, and we've got Trident Marine, we, everything <coughs> except probably build a ship. Now, we didn't have a high speed product. Well, now we have a, another orange rectangle that we can add to that to offer high speed product. And that allows us to offer our customers the right product for the right application. Market trends. There's a lot of interest in smaller packages, and particularly hybrid. So again, as the packages get smaller, the power needs get smaller, the Barcelona 14 fits that. And then the top one, that's the business block. If you look at that, this is showing between one and two megawatts. And you look at probably the last 20 years, medium speed products have been declining, and high speed products have been growing. So, as a company, did we want to operate in that one to two megawatt range? Yes, we do. So, having a product that fits in there is another reason why we have the VAPS reporting. If you look at below one megawatt, it's even worse if you're a medium speed manufacturer. <coughs> so, one word here. This is an extract from our press release at the November last year. Really, what I'd like to point out is a couple of things. One is in the middle there, so our partner is Liebherr, a German company operating in Switzerland and France, but we have a partnership on marine engines with Liebherr. And then the bottom one is around our Barcelona High tool. So I talked a little bit, previous slide, about the introduction or the interest and growth in hybrid applications. Well, we announced at the same time a package that included the Valsula 14 in a hybrid package system. So, just a little bit more about our partner. They're in lots of different applications. They have a huge engine range. The good thing for us, uh, the good thing for them, is their activities in the marine business are probably limited to cranes. So, if people know about cranes and that, then you might see a leap there crane. We wanted a high speed engine, they wanted to sell more products, a win-win partnership. So where can the Barcelona 14 go? In one sense I don't like these pictures, or these pictures, because we can go anywhere, everywhere, depending on the power, and also what meets the customer needs. But, from toes, to uh, Rajan's yacht, the second line on the bottom there, um, ferries, pilot boats, uh, auxiliary gen sets in, on merchant vessels and container, naval applications again, auxiliary, auxiliary engines and gen sets. And then I don't know how many people watch or have watched the deadliest catch on the Discovery Channel fishing program. Well, if you look at the bottom right. That's the Cornelia Marie that has a couple of high speed engines in there that are not Barcelona 14 yet, but they're one of our competitors. So fishing, a big opportunity for this product. Here's the technical data, high level technical data. When I joined Barcelona, which is one year ago on Monday, thank you very much, um, I asked them what the Barcelona 14 was. Because I come from a high speed background, and the company I work for, we talked about leaders. Well, the Barcelona 14 is a 135 millimeter bore, and Barcelona describes their products by <coughs> bore size, so we get the 14. But to people from the high speed world, it's a 27 liter and a 36 liter product. There's a V12 and a V16. It's from 749 kilowatts to a, just over a, a megawatt in the 12V version, and then a megawatt up to 1340 in the 16V. And then slightly lower for auxiliary 
things are like click applic application. Fuel economy, not bad, not bad. It's a modern engine, so it's a pretty competitive fuel economy. And then if you look at this, the sizing, again, hope that backs up the word about compact. It's a nice compact product. And then from a weight, again, a very competitive product from a weight point of view. Ratings. Again, I spend a lot of my time talking to my colleagues who are medium speed cars, and all the products are continuous. So they're continuous, they can be used for anything for as long as they want. Well, the high speed market, you use for different things, and depending on how that product is used, depends on how much power you, you use it for. So the A ratings are what I would put the continuous rating. And then we go B, depending on that, a bit more lighter duty, so a heavy duty rating, C, and then D. So, for example, a, a yacht may use a, a D rating, but a really hard working push boat may use an A rating. The gensets, auxiliary gensets, diesel electric, hybrid packages, we have the 1500 and 1800 rating. So we go from 675 kilowatts to 1500, uh, 865 at 1800 for our 12V, and then 900 to 1155 for our 16V. Tier three, something that we have to meet in certain areas, it's probably something we probably would want to meet if we, if we didn't have to, but it's tier three is a NOx standard. I am offering NOx only. And to achieve and meet that, like a lot of other high-speed manufacturers, we use an SCR system. That SCR system is a Bartlett SCR system. So if you need a tier three product, that depends where you operate and what you do, then we offer you a solution. We don't offer you a, an engine and after treatment, we offer you a solution, and that solution can be different configurations to meet the installation of the vessel. One good thing about working for Vartelet is we have a, a lot of products, as I go back to those nice orange triangles, we have a lot of products that can be put together in a package. And here's an example of showing the Vartelet 14 and then two of our thruster products. So we have the WSD11 and the WSD14. And you can see the difference in volatile for the output of the packages based on using either the 11 or the 14 and then the 16V or the 12V. So this product, I showed a picture about tugboats. It doesn't go into all tugboats. No, the product has its limitations. But we're up to the 14, 42 volat pole in a standard tugboat configuration. If you start talking hybrid, then it depends on the package or the sizing of the battery, which you could add to that to give a, an increased volat pole. So, when is it available? Well, we had this lovely launch at the end of last year, and the engine, uh, the first engine, will leave the factory in December this year. That's the 12V engine that goes into the genset. That's a tier two, so the non-SCR product. Then we have a propulsion version of that. Um, next year, I think that's going to be a bit earlier than we're showing on the chart, which is great for service vehicles. And then towards the middle of the next year, we introduce the tier three solution with the SCR package, and then the 16V. So around this time next year, maybe a couple of months, 14 months time, we'll have a full range of 12 and 16V, tier two, tier three, genset, and propulsion products. How does this fit into our portfolio? So as I said, Bartola has a, a really good medium speed product range, and now we've got this high speed product. And where does it fit? So you can see here, it fits at the bottom end of our W20 range. So if we've got a customer that wants a megawatt, 1100 kilowatts, then it's really understanding that customer's application and usage will determine 
whether we would prefer high speed products or medium speed products. The comparison between these two products. So this is taking the 1300 kilowatt range. And this is all about knowing and understanding what our customers need. I often call it one of the green monsters of our customers. What's the really important thing that keeps our customers away, keeps them worried? And if it's fuel economy, stick with a medium speed engine. Yeah? Interestingly, I found out that some people, some customers like to know how many cylinders, because then there's a maintenance thought of, of a lot of cylinders that need to maintain these. So again, medium speed product, six cylinder compared with a six cylinder. I find that very strange coming from a high speed background, by the way, but there are customers that, that that's an important factor. Weight. If I was weight critical, I think I know which engine I'd choose. There's a slight difference between um, a high speed and a medium speed product. Similarly to, to sizing, if you've got a, a size constraint, then a high speed product generally fits much better than a medium speed product. Fuel, we will launch with MBO capability. If we've got a customer that operates in parts of the world where the fuel quality is very questionable, or they want to use HFO, medium speed product. So understanding where the vessel should operate, what's the concern for the customer, we should be able to then guide and say, direct people which we product we will recommend. Comparison. I think engine A, engine B, and engine C compare our 12B and our 16B again. I think the heavy duty rating, to be fair to everybody, tier two, so I'm not the non high product. And you can look across the line, yeah, but if you if you need 1100 kilowatts, we stack up very good against our competitors. Really good agency competitors. Um, weight, again, if weight is a problem or critical, I think we have a good option. Space, power density, a, a, a good comparison between what's out there in the market already. That's the propulsion product. If we look at diesel electric, auxiliary jet set, Products, then again I picked engine A, engine B, and engine C. These are different ones, or one of them is the same. Maybe the colour gives it away. Um, but if you're looking for a diesel electric installation or an auxiliary jetset installation, and if we can, if I could influence the designer to say you need um, at least one megawatt, we've got a good solution. Again, fuel economy, high speed products running at um, set speeds, 15 or 1800, are all optimized for that performance. So there isn't a great deal to say between fuel economy and product. Um, again, looking at weight and size and those types of things. So just a, a comparison against some of the existing market. Support. The one good thing about this product is it falls under our global support network. And one of the really good things about the company, we're something like 18, 18 and a half thousand employees. There's probably close to 11,000 employees are involved in customer support, uh, interactions with the customer. So a product that benefits from that existing organization. And I think that was it. So, thank you very much. My takeaway, Greg, is not all engines are made equal. Uh, right, like I said, uh, it's question time. So if there's uh, anybody who's interested in asking a question or raising a comment, please uh, raise your hand and we'll have uh, the mic come to you, sir. The floor is all yours. Ladies and gentlemen. Yes, uh, Sundar. Mm -hmm. 
Three minutes. My name is Ram from BNB BN. My question is to Mr. Andrews. The second name is very difficult for me to again say correctly, so I don't venture into that. Overall, I could see that the quality of work and your capability was well demonstrated. It was a very good piece of demonstrating the capability. But my question is related to the access for your technicians and personnel to go into the offer and space. What are the main improvements and main aspects that you are concerned for the safety of the person? Are there any changes which have come or which have taken place because you have a vast experience for many years in the field? Yeah, so far we've had a, a zero accident and as we have been uh, doing it, the, uh, the air that we are using is constantly uh, monitored because it's coming from the same air supply as we are using when the driver is wearing a helmet or not. So that is, that is uh, and there's a, um, an extra measure. So he, he needs his helmet to go into the, uh, into the habitat in case, in case something happens. So the water level would come up for whatever, for whatever reason. They got their helmet sitting right there. The supervisor is on top of the surface so he can monitor things. There's communication and there's a plan. Yeah, you answered just one small part. I think you have a lot of custom-based copper dams. So in which case, will there be a change or an impact? Uh, custom-based copper dams, that, uh, referring to the tunnel cluster repairs, for example, they are built by a company in the, in the UK, and they are certified um, materials that we are using, and they are doing the engineering in-house. So we are, we are buying a product. It's exclusively built for us because we come up with the concepts, they do the engineering, and we get a certified uh, product with us. And as I've shown in my presentation, the attachment point, we've done our part of engineering on that. We, have, we know how strong our welding is, and we have the certified people, so we know, we know how much weld we need to do on those attachment points. So that is, that is being tested. Thank you, Andrew. I well, think it would be my pleasure to talk to you again more. Thank you, sir. Yes, Mr. Vendor. My name is Engineer Ron Mehta. I am indeed impressed by the presentation done by Mr. Abe and Mr. Kheria. And most of the questions are answered. First, I will put a question to Mr. Greg Dunn. I'm basically an engineer turned into marketing guru. My question is always simple and one point. What is the uniqueness of Vatsla engine? Even though you have given the comparison, but I would like to hear from you one line. What is the uniqueness of Vatsla over others? Then the next thing which I want to tell Mr. Arvind in one time, you have really indeed done lots of hard work. Many of the questions have been answered. And I have one technical question. When you are straightening the blade, do you do the heat treat? And if you do, how do you do it? Yeah. Um, heat treatment, we're not doing that below the water level. On the, uh, on the hot style propellers, it used to be uh, manganese bronze propellers. And then this heat treatment was, was necessary, was mandatory to, to, to do after any repairs were done. But on the, uh, on the present castings, the nickel aluminum bronze castings, where uh, Watsala, for example, makes its propellers on, it's not a requirement to do heat straightening, but we are doing the, the MBT inspection. So to answer your question, we're not doing any heat treatment below the water. I am indeed impressed by your taglines. Since I told you I'm more market oriented, one tagline was die of another option. There you have been very, very successful. But do tell me some stories if you have done any work in Kutera, which is near home. Many of the instances you have told, they are Norway, Holland, and Germany. Have you done anything in Fujairah? Yeah, yeah. We, we are working on Fujairah and in, in Dubai on a regular basis. And a regular basis up till now, meaning that we are here like every two months, but maybe for a larger, for a larger program. So 
exchanging about us or we recently been involved in a large welding repair on, on offshore from Java. So that's you know very recent that we've been doing that. So yes, we have been. And on resurrection for you, for the testimony you received from the six shoes of the carnival cruise ship company. Yeah. That you know, he acknowledged with the win win strategy. Yeah. I wish you success. You will be doing very well in this area also. No more questions. Thank you very much. Hey, but didn't you have a question for uh, Greg? Uh, yeah. <laughs> sir, uh, sorry, sir. With due respect. Can I make one line? Uniqueness. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I, I have to give you a political answer there because I think it's very difficult to give a one line answer on a ge generic position. Uh, it's very much uh, we want to know how the vessel is used, how the, um, uh, the owner operates it, where it operates, and I think the benefits based on understanding that. If I try to sum up in what one of the benefits is, um, in general, is being part of the Waterway organization from a support and service point of view. We have probably the largest global support organization, and falling into that organization, I think, is great. My compliment to both of you. Yes, uh, Mr. Malik. Can you wait for the mic, please? Well, you can try. <laughs> it won't work. Because if you tie to a certain type of oil, then that oil might not be applicable to a high speed engine. So if you want to continue using that oil, I would recommend a medium speed engine. So it's really understanding what you do and how you operate. So yep, the marine industry is very conservative. No, see what I mean, now you know it, what type of stuff you're getting. <laughs> he, he is not working for the ship running. He is worrying about this meter, how is it running in the So is the is one thousand uh, I don't is one thousand RPM the difference between uh, slow speed uh, medium speed and speed? I think if you ask different manufacturers, uh, so we, we would say twelve hundred mm. and below, mm. or twelve hundred to probably eight hundred mm. is medium speed, and then you get below that is Low speed, and then above 1200 high speed. is a high speed. Mm -hmm. But you will get certain manufacturers that will oh, right. differentiate slightly. Got it. Oh. Yeah. Yes, sir, Greg. Right. Sigmund, again, I think I echo the sentiments in the room when I say thank you for the education. And you all were very impressed. Uh, I have two questions. I'll ask the second one first. <laughs> 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 Greg, if I may, um, will the high speed engine ever be adapted to work on LNG, or is that never an option? At, from our position, what we want to do is make a success of the diesel version first. So if you look at the, but if you look at the market size for LNG in those size of engines, at the moment it isn't very big, and there's probably two high speed engines. Run an LNG in the market. Is that yours or somebody Not somebody, I, I mean, ours, I'd say we, we, we'll make a, we have to make a success of running on on the diesel MDO. Going forward, Vartel as a company have said that LNG is the fuel of the future. So watch this space. 
I've received the best for last. Next question to you, Bhane. Uh, you're a humble paint consultant, so the idea of creating a pocket of air under the ship uh, when in the water is quite fascinating and allowing personal access to that space. You mentioned it's a pressurized environment, right? So you have to you have to displace water to be able to create that pocket of air. So can personal access it without any PV or do you need any equipment in order to access? Um, you could you could uh, look at it. It's a, it's similar to uh, to a diving operation because you're working in a dry environment, but it's still the same pressure that you're working under. So it's it's the same equipment you're using. You're also using the same uh, air that you're using from the helmet. If you put the helmet over your head, you're in this this controlled space where, where the air is is uh, certified and con controlled. So you it's the same. You have to put that in gear on when you're in that environment. No, you, you, you don't have to, but you have to you have to use the diving gear obviously to get there. Because oh, it's as so a once you're in that once you're in that pocket of air, then you need to wear any equipment? Uh, no. No, just your 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 uh, your safety uh, thank you. Thank you yeah. very much guys. Uh, Dali, may you respond? Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you for the lovely presentation. Okay, my question would be for Mr. Andre. I was operating a bike carrier for some time back and we had an issue of this current view valve seal leaking, okay, using a very conventional oil. And we were passing on from Sri Lanka to Indonesia. We also were working at that point in time, but I think the solutions were not ready in the middle east. Now my question is that okay, there were some operators doing the services from the Euro. Now getting the equipment down to Indonesia off Indonesia, okay, doing it underwater, was costing the rate of hundred thousand dollars to hundred fifty thousand. And this was with, still with a question mark. Now, going to management with this kind of a thing is always very difficult. So I would like to know that if you are doing it right now with Bhaskila, with you and the team in the Middle East, what would you look at the cost for doing one seal visual repair around this area? Um, it, it depends very much on the location. Like, like the, the, the surface, if it's not available in India or wherever the vessel is, then we have to bring in the technicians. So hopefully in the future we we're, we're trying to get closer to our clients with our with our with our footprint in, in the world as you can see in my presentation. But at this point we would have to send the technicians from 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 Europe to the location. So that's adding cost. The cost for the job itself that wouldn't be any different from from being working in a home port. But we do have the additional cost for guys getting on a plane, sending the equipment there, and that would indeed raise the cost. And then the question mark is that we don't want to decide for you or we don't want to calculate for you what the added value of this service is in your circumstance. Because if you're a loaded bird, boat carrier and you need to get to the next port in a certain time and that there's nothing available, then it might be an option. But we would be the first ones uh, advising you to trim the, the vessel above water, put a staging on it and change the seals as conceded. Because we know that happens a lot with boat carriers, but that all depends on the situation. Yeah, we tried an option, but I think the bulk carriers on the loaded condition with 54,000 dead weight cannot come up to the same condition out of water. Yeah. So they will stay in the water. Yeah. But as soon as the full load condition, they cannot be taken too much because yeah. of the breaking set. Yeah. So we were trying to do the third cargo discharge when we were around 12,000 and tried to bring it up. But still, it was not feasible. Yeah. So the question remains now if we would come to one minimum level, having it all discharged and being on sea, what could be the cost of the let's say the per year as of now? Okay, let's take an example. Yeah. Well, How much do you think of the cost of uh, changing the seal would cost in an uh, offshore refuge gyre? Um, if we would do an offshore refuge gyre to give you uh, an, an estimate, I think we would be looking between 100 and 150 thousand dollars to do a job like that. The job itself, and it's hard to tell because, the, like, cost for flights, uh, cost for uh, shifting equipment from from Europe to here, that is that is uh, that is. Cost is varies a lot, so it's it's hard to give you a hard number. But I do like if we would do a seal replacement in the port of Rotterdam, which is one of our home ports where we have the trained technicians, then it would be anywhere between fifty and sixty thousand euros, because that we would complete in three days working around uh, working around the clock with the six man crew for six or seven man crew per team, and that so that would be the cost of the job itself. But it's a transport and a transport of two plane equipment that's adding these costs. And that's, well, that's, that's just a given that that would bounce out. But 
that reason we're trying to expand our footprint that we are getting closer to our clients. So in a few years from now, if we have this job in Shanghai, like here for example, as, as, as you're mentioning, then we have the people that we have locally have trained up to our standards, and then they could do it on our own. But for the time being, we would have to send the specialist types from, from, uh, from the Netherlands to execute the work. Thank you. That's 5% back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, say as an overhaul, I would, we would strongly recommend that you use Basler to do the overhaul. I think up until then, all general maintenance was ship crew. Obviously, we're talking about oil and filter changes, we're talking about some belt changes, we're talking about some adjustments. <coughs> but we see, because it's, it's specialist and there are some specialist tools when you put your needs in an overhaul, then our recommendation and our direction would be for Basler to do that. Yeah? Um, as, a, as a crankshaft, I think it depends on, on the level of damage on the crankshaft, but the aim would be to have oversized bearings so that you could at least um, maybe do some grinding, re-grinding, and then do some oversized bearings. Yes, 
So what was it too early or not? Yeah, it's too early. Yeah. But still, you must be somewhere to working on it and estimating what you need. Yeah. Three times as well as it was. So, so I would say the background I come from, Mean time to overhaul was based on fuel burn. Yeah. So an engine will burn a fuel and then So if you work that engine hard, your overhaul will be sooner. Yeah. If you work that in a light application, then that overhaul will extend. If I was to say what I think our mean time is across all applications, we're probably talking about 20,000 hours. Yeah. But if you have a tub, have a tub works two and a half thousand hours a year. Mm -hmm. 5% overload, I'd expect that to be 25, 26, 27, depends on how well you maintain it, that type of thing. But if I, you want me to give you a number uh, of. Uh, Normally, other buildings, what you normally, they should have, you can monitor the, the 
performance of the image individually. Suppose one of the image is having improved, how can I monitor this image having any problem? Suppose you are six cylinder or you are saying that pure cylinder. So one cylinder have improved, or maybe break down in anything is wrong in the fuel unit or something fuel pump is wrong. So how can I monitor the fuel? Because normally from other fuel units we can monitor fuel temperature or we can take performance of individual units. This engine, how we monitor individual engines? Both engineers. Hmm? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so again, if, if, I mean, obviously, from a fuel point of view, you've got the depth of an inch cylinder. Uh, you have exhaust temperatures. So, uh, in, as per this uh, uh, class, if you are fit with more than 900, you cannot keep any uh, temperature individual units, and you cannot put any. So we, we obviously have to meet all the class requirements. So if it's above 900, uh, then we can't, then we won't. Uh, I want the vessel, uh, vessel they have a uh, RPM is 1200 RPMs and it is no indicator there. But uh, uh, there is uh, exhaust temperature is there that we can monitor by the exhaust temperature. But this uh, engine, is, uh, I have a one more vessel uh, that is a there's no option for uh, monitoring any individual units. That is my question. Colleague in the audience, I think we, we would probably both disagree yeah. with that opinion. Yeah. But I, I yeah. 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 You don't have anything? Can, can you give us the mic, please? So yeah, so that kind of stuff is becoming available. I 
think is also relevant to sound when we're moving more to electronic high-speed engines. That is now available on, on, on our older generation engines that we still put in the market today, which is not available. So the kind of get the crosses a bit higher, the efficiency is better, and you can monitor the engine better, you can control the engine better. So those are there. But Because 
I, I don't think some countries would be coming from other world of it, but we, we would be in that information question yeah. before. So I, so I think everything's doable. You know, if, if, if it's a solution, and it, and it, yeah, if it's a solution, and, it, and that's what it could be required, I think all parties should say. Yeah, because it's based on the safeguard rules which you raised. Yeah, safeguard is a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Because right now, people are just sitting in the corners and walking together. I think they should have done it already. Yeah. Because yeah. people are coming. And we are trying to understand what the problem is. The safeguard is the only way to know what's going on. Yeah. We don't know how to explain it. So it's a, it's a political thing. Because if yeah. you don't know all this, you won't know it. If it's that, it's complaining, but it's like only this. So it's yeah. like so we all have remote monitoring support that's available, um, and I think you've got very good thoughts. But what is it that the, the specific customer needs on that monitoring? What do you? So we are now things that you don't need. See everybody, uh, Mr. Meta. Yes, sir. That's the last question coming up from Mr. Meta.